Hi, good good day to you. Um, it really, it's really an honor to see you, Dr. Zol Kifli and Dr. Helmi. Um, both of you are part of the Selangor Task Force uh, on issues of COVID-19. Um, uh, I'm here and we're having a conversation about COVID-19 as part of the University of Nottingham's Asia Research Institute Malaysia COVID conversations. Uh, so it's really, um, we are going to talk about what's happening in Selangor, what's different, what do we need to know? And so I'd like to start with you, uh, Dr. Zul, as a former health minister. Uh, how do you see the situation in Selangor from your perspective? Right. By the way, uh, thank for having us, uh, Prof. Welsh. Um, yeah, I must say that, you know, um, moving from the Minister of Health to a state, particularly in Selangor, uh, is quite a change of task. And I must say that you very well know that health is a domain of the of the federal, uh, you know, uh, 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 government, mm -hmm. and we are here as a state government uh, to complement the work of the uh, Minister of Health uh, in Putrajaya. So I'm very conscious of that, and for whatever that we could complement and supplement, we'll do our level best. Now, <clears throat> particularly in Selangor. Yeah, going by absolute numbers, we are the state apparently with the biggest number of cases, of course, you know, but oh, but uh, of course that is in relation to population, you know, uh, I mean, uh, when but when you see as per population, case per population, if I may say that way, uh, you would very well see that it is not as, it's not as bad after all, you know. Because uh, <clears throat> I must say that, you know, going by infection rate per population, um, <clears throat> we are not too bad at all. Uh, you can see, if I may use the word as outliers, you have Putrajaya at 0 0.76 per population, K Kuala Lumpur, Federal Territory of Kuala Lumpur at 0 0.6, 0 0.69. And Nigris Milan, uh, incidentally, is higher than S0.41. And then came MERS, Selangor at 0 0.21, you know, together with Malacca at 0 0.21. The national average is 0 0.18, you know, infection rate per population. So <clears throat> putting that in perspective, I must say that Selangor, you know, with uh, a state with the largest number of population by way of 6.5 million of population in, in staying in Selangor, um, we are not we are not uh, that bad after all. But going by uh, absolute numbers, yes, you know. So uh, you must be very well aware that the disease is in itself a function of uh, human interaction, you know, urbanization, you know, and and there you have it all in Selangor, you know, a state that's got a lot of industries. You know, uh, by way of its density, by way of its, you know, the, the, the wet markets, you know, the construction sites and whatnot. So uh, you would have expected uh, Selangor to, uh, to to pose such uh, 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 positive cases of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, infection. So um, it is not a surprise at all. And when I came in with my team. You know, we were very well aware that we are on an uphill task uh, bringing down the numbers. So, yeah, we were very clear what we are in to do. And from day one, we were uh, premised on creating awareness, education. You know, you know very well that this is a disease which has come in this way. Uh, 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 not much is known about its so its pathophysiology, its epidemiology is an unseen enemies, you know. So all those, you know, that, that really, they really challenge us. So, yeah, we were very clear that our first agenda was to educate Slangorian, to educate the Slangorian, to understand the disease. And most importantly, uh, having understood that, we they have just got to culturalize and put in place, you know, personal hygiene thing or whatever, what, you know, we will go at length on that. And as well, uh, you know, when it's the time, uh, you know, already the social distancing and, and the hand washing, sanitizers and all those. So, <clears throat> so we were very clear that initially it was on 
educating slang Orion. And then secondly, of course, is to ensure that slang will get you know the the, 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 the approach of uh, you know flattening the curve, the slang or a bit curve uh, really down <clears throat> with our intents. Uh, uh, not only uh, this is where I think we will go at length to tell you how of how we approach it slightly differently uh, uh, over contact tracing you know, using you know BDA big data analytics using technology and whatnot and of, of course you know intensifying our community uh, so-called community mass uh, screening uh, targeted though ta targeted yeah so uh, that is a nutshell of my introduction of how we see slang of uh, tasks uh, for our uh, slang of tasks for uh, COVID-19. Thank you very much. You've made some very excellent points about the looking at the infection rate, looking at the kind of the different aspects of policy, issues, education, issues of different parts of contact tracing, and putting Selangor in perspective. Dr. Helma, you're an, a specialist on public health and an analytic expert. How do you see it from your perspective? Mm, well, I think like since I'm managing the analytics portfolio, right, so my role is to provide relevant, updated data and insight to the state leadership and also to the scientific committee so that evidence-based decision uh, can be executed. I think when we talk about analytics, how you frame the question is pertinent yeah, when you're making decision, you know, and I think um, um, whether thanks or not for the John Hopkins dashboard, everyone uh, tend to treat uh, COVID-19 as if like it's a scoreboard, like, you know, how many infection is coming, how many people is dying, you know, and that's actually quite, that's good to create an awareness. But I think when it comes to policy decision making, uh, we need to, we need to expand a little bit more and to have a more holistic approach. So we realized early on that the analytics alone should not be limited only to the viruses or only to the cases, but it should also be expanded uh, to take into account the vulnerability of the community. And this is where Selangor is unique, right? So you can find, you probably can find the richest person in Selangor, and also you can find the urban poor in Selangor. And this is why Selangor is such a dynamic state. So in our analytics, we take into account not only the population density, right? But what does our society compose of? What is the proportion of the elderly? What are the proportion of pregnant women? What is the proportion of our marginalized? Where are they? Uh, so that we can have a holistic overview on how to chart our strategy. And why we are doing this? We are doing this because uh, there's science on it, right? When we talk about the COVID-19 infection, it will, affect, it will affect people across each bracket. But the burden... Uh, of the outcome, you know, like people of the elderly, I mean, those people who are in the elderly bracket, uh, they have a higher mortality rate. So the question is like, how do we as a state leadership uh, take into account, take into account the scientific nature of the infection of how the, how, how the virus function in society and how do we adapt to it? Because I don't think we can I, we don't think that like we can uh, eliminate the trait of COVID-19 in the near future. Future. So we must find a way on how to adapt to it. Yeah. Very good. Very interesting. And also the, the focus on the vulnerable communities all shows this kind of this depth in terms of approach. So from both of you, which do you see as the kind of the most significant problem in the state? The, the biggest challenge you think that that Selangor is facing? Uh, Dr. So why don't you start? Right. Um, well, I must say going by what uh, Dr. Helmi mentioned earlier, you have beside the density of the population, yeah, then in terms of population density and as well as the other thing that is part of the whole urbanized, you know, urban and uh, uh, kind of setting. But what is important to realize is as well, you have a diverse population. It's, as I said earlier, as alluded earlier, where you have people in the city, they have got better knowledge and understanding and who can work from home and abide to procedures and SOPs. But as well, you have a large number of people who are self-employed. Those working at night market, selling burgers, you know, who get out to work, you know, and work. And, you know, they are less uh, in the CV in terms of, you know, of, of by way of, you know, knowledge and, 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 and awareness of all this. But nonetheless, Nonetheless, you see, of course, uh, by way of life, 
by way of livelihood. You know, bo both are both are affected. You know, both both are affected. You know, because okay. everybody's calling. <laughs> 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 You're yeah, I thought I was in that. So okay, um, sorry about that. So so no uh, seriously, how I see the challenge uh, 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 um, coming this way in terms of slang or is when we started off, we had the you know the number the largest numbers of red zone district, you know, that where where we have been, you know, uh, sort of, you know, we, we started off with uh, this, uh, you know, red zone where it is, you know, defined by uh, cases of more than 41, you know, so, uh, 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 so to immediately put in place, you know, when, uh, when, when, I, when we came, because we were on, on that, the MCO thing, by the way, Prof. Wesh, on the 18th of March, you know, where they, where they instituted the, the MCOs. So we were grappling, you know, with the task of uh, of ensuring that uh, we wanted you know, MCOs to be, of course, observed. But at the same time, we want to do a little bit more but by then, by not only, you know, manually doing our the contact tracing by way of memory of the index cases of those who have been you know found uh, found positive and that they were to remember you know you know who else were they in touch with where did they go what not so <clears throat> immediately we saw the challenge is for us to put in both data and the science both data and the science. So, <clears throat> well, because I've, I'm, I'm most privileged to have, you know, ID specialists on board with me, and and also have public health physician and epidemiologists, and you have, you know, person like Dr. Helmo who is an AI data scientist as well. So, you know, we immediately wanted to not just be doing more of the same of what federal government is doing, what we're doing, but uh, we wanted we want to we want to have data. And as well as science to be guide to be guiding us. So all the more reason we will always like to think out of the box and do slightly differently. But the, the, of course, uh, you know the challenge then was, you know, you have a, you have a task force here, but you have the most cases. You know, you know, they they, they, they judge you by that. Yeah. So you know, we, we felt challenged on that, but we were very conscious that we are not just firefighting. You know, as alluded by Dr. Almi earlier, we want to get correct policy, right policy in place, and that uh, we want to be, you want, it, you want it to be premise on, 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 on create, you know, things like, you know, by way of, it's, it's so difficult, you know, by way of incubation period and all those things, by way of getting data to, 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 to plot epic, epic curve, for example, and to see whether you have really flattened it whether you're past the peak, you know, and, and all this. So we were very consciously doing it, not wanting to go against anything of the, not trampling, or not, not going, you know, against any, by way of, you know, whatever that makes the federal, you know, by the way, Ministry of Health, a bit, a nerve, a bit jittery with us. So we were very, you know, we were, we were, we were chatting our past, you know, very tactfully and judiciously, so to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think I like to add it into that. It's like, well, your question was like, what is the biggest problem uh, in Selangor? Mm -hmm. I think rather than talking about biggest problem, right? I think one of, I think we do have uh, another big thing. I think Selangor is in such a unique place that it have the biggest responsibility. When you think about the population of Selangor representing uh, the biggest part of population in Malaysia, it means like the national average. And the national trend is actually determined by the state of Selangor. If we do well in the state of Selangor, then we will actually influence how the national average and national trend look like, right? So I think it's a big responsibility uh, uh, for, for, for Selangor and how to handle that. Um, and I think it is timely of why we are doing our approach differently, right? If I'm not mistaken, and maybe Dr. Zul can correct me in this, if I'm not mistaken, Selangor is the only state that actually have a physical uh, uh, operational room, like a state operative room. <laughs> and we are also the only one that I think we, we actually have a state level scientific advisor. Um, and why these are all important? Because I understand the uniqueness of Selangor. If, you, if we are to compare, Selang if we are to 
if you have to take Selangor as as its own state, right? So you see, like we are we are we are the the economic heartbeat of Malaysia. These are uh, the economic heartbeat. These are the urban area, and therefore, like we might be able to compare ourselves to places like Taiwan uh, or to places uh, like Singapore. But we know we cannot replicate their approach because in Malaysia, while we are urbanized, but we also encompass such a huge area. So you can't you can't possibly replicate those strategy. Uh, and let's, however, look into uh, those countries that are successful in managing their uh, outbreak, like um, like uh, New Zealand or like Australia, right? But they have the I would say they hit the jackpot of the fact that their population are more sparse, are more apart, and therefore they don't have uh, the same. They are not in the same situation that we are. It means is that. Selangor have to come up with its own approach. It have to be a recipe uh, by by the state leadership that must fit uh, into the that must fit into the demographic of Selangor itself. And I think that is our biggest challenge. That you have such a unique demographic, you have such a unique spread uh, of people, uh, such a, and likewise, you have to handle the national average by yourself. So. How do you think, you know, you've talked about how your approach is adopting science and, and data, trying to bring in, in vulnerable communities, try to deal and grapple with the issues, diversity, that combination of urbanization, but also some semi-rural areas mm -hmm. that you have to tackle within the context of Selangor. So what do you think is different about your approach in Selangor that's, that kind of stands out compared to the, the general federal government's approach? You know, are there kind of sort of uh, things that you would say that is that, you know, you're, you're emphasizing earlier that you're complementing their approach. But uh, are there things that, for example, have been uh, quite sharply different that may be at odds? Or are there things that are also that really are very strongly complementing in a very different and unique way? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, I must be very careful here. <laughs> not, not, not wanting to sound like, you know, we are better than the Ministry of Health, you know, but we must be very, very careful. Uh, but, uh, but I must say that uh, to, all, to all intent and purposes, we are doing more or less the same thing, you know, by way of, you know, uh, uh, by way of um, firstly aggressively doing what is known as uh, you know, uh, tr tracking firstly to you know to trace to to do our uh, to you know to do our trace to do our what we call uh, tra tracking. Then you know uh, then we do our we, uh, uh, then we, we we do our uh, the what we call as contact tracing, you know, testing, isolating, treating. So those are those are you know and of course the WHO mantra is test 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 you know, to, to make sure that we get to really, you know, have the kind of uh, uh, the volume of tests that will allow us to see the, 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 the true prevalence and, and the incidence in the community. So I must say that having said what, you know, we do uh, more or less the same what uh, the federal government, the federal ministry is doing, but we know that <clears throat> we know that particularly in, in, in slang or uh, if we, we, we just would, you know, allow the, what is known as the, the Department of Health uh, at the state level to only do and conduct their kind of testing, uh, you know, we, we, they, they will certainly uh, face uh, an uphill task. So that's where the task force uh, put in place what is known as the community, mass community testing guided by our kind of um, uh, big data analytics where we get to zoom in on a more targeted testing. So testing policy is so important, Prof. Welsh, yeah? Testing, uh, testing policy is so important. South Korea got it right, Taiwan got it right, because, you know, they, they, they really, yeah, yeah. So we, uh, yeah, 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 exercise on that. And we, particularly Slango, we, I think we, a total of over 5,000 over, we, 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 you know, we complement the federal uh, ministry. On that, so we <clears throat> uh, we we got that I think uh, to to really get and and by way of our uh, community testing, we were able to you know we were able to, able to identify positive cases while doing that, and I think Dr. Helmi will go you know in greater detail of, as to how we we conduct that, and as well as I've stated earlier, the contact tracing, 
it's also slim, something slightly different that we do and we have just you know launched a, a, a program called Salanka and of, of which again Dr. Helmi is, is going to dwell on that in greater detail. So yes, uh, I must say that to a more, to more, more or less, you know, we are doing like what they are doing, but 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 we want to add on, you know, to to be using a bit more technology and a bit more data analytics because you know we can't be doing you know the challenge in Slango is because Slango is one of the richest state, you know, the richest state in fact. So we want to make sure that we got uh, put in place a technology, big data analytics. And 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 some form of you know the in the contact tracing what is known as uh, what by by you by way of technology you know or the program that we call as Lanka so um, yes but you must know that for whatever that we do uh, we will of course then you know pass it uh, we do our what is known as ACD our active contact <coughs> active detection which is a target community testing that seeks to complement you know MOH initiative however all cases that have been referred uh, all cases found positive would be referred to MOH uh, uh, facilities so that's, that's that's how we 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 do it, we do it uh, uh, prof uh, right yeah uh, well, I like to uh, I would I like to compound uh, on our testing policy, right? Just to give you a clear view of how we do it differently, right? So first thing first, uh, the Slango State uh, testing policy is the idea is to complement what ministry is doing, and we know that uh, on this uh, on the on the state health department level, they are very busy, they are very overwhelmed uh, with a number of. Uh, hotspot of the number of red zone at that point of time. So who, how the way we do it is like, hey, let's do community testing, but let's not uh, let's not let's not make those efforts redundant. Let's not attack let's not attack the red zone. But can we use uh, whatever analytics that we have in hand to actually identify uh, upcoming places? You know, those places that shows the early trend of incidents and can we go into there, isolate them early, test them early, uh, sort of nip it on the buds, and to make sure that green zone then will remain green. And that's basically what we do. So our analytics is sophisticated though. Our analytics is a bit more sophisticated. It, 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 it's, it's not only take into account uh, number of cases, right? But uh, we employ this model that, we, and I'm going to be a little bit technical here. Uh, we, 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 we employ three models, actually. We employ number one is called inherent risk of contagion. Inherent risk contagion, and the other one is social viscosity index. And these are the measure of how people move in a certain geo unit. How do they move? Uh, uh, among those premises that are still open during the MCO. And this gives us a better overview the fact that one cases in neighborhood A and one cases in neighborhood B actually have a different predicament in the future, mm -hmm. right? And that, is, uh, that, and that is why we come up with a testing policy that, hey, you should go to this neighborhood, although it is still green. And we do have a lot of those questions, like why do you go to this, you know, like, places which doesn't seem like they have a lot of burden, right? Uh, yeah, but, but the, because we are, not trying to, we are not trying to dose off the big fire, what we try to catch the small fire before it becomes big, if I, mean, if, if I can say it so. Uh, so that is one. Uh, and the other way, how do we complement contact tracing using technology, right? So you see our analytics are sophisticated, but I think when we deploy technology to the community, it has to be simple because it needs to have a bigger a buy-in. And community is not a homogeneous group. They, they are different, different. Uh, they are heterogeneous group, right? And that is why we think we can, um, this is why we think we can complement the use of technology, but those technology must be simple enough. It must be something that is synonym that people have done day to day. And that's why we come up with Salanka. Because Selanka is basically is a QR based registration. It's, it's nothing new. It's just like using a tool that is already there, but for different purpose. And I think people are a little bit more comfortable with that because you don't have to, yeah, it, it, it doesn't feel 
for some segment of our population, it doesn't feel as intrusive. But it wasn't really about the inclusion, right? For, for I, I, I understand from a lot of our user, it simply just the fact that it is it feels lightweight. You just need to step in on the store, scan the QR code, and then you are good to go. So it balanced out uh, all those pain points that we have when we talk about uh, digital surveillance. Yeah. Dr. Helma, you you talked about how you put out small fires. Can you give me, a, if you can talk about it, because obviously some of these may be sensitive, but do, are there any particular examples that so far in the Excelangor experience where you feel you've put out potential fires uh, in terms of your specific areas? All right. Uh, we will not name we will not name the area though, but I will of give course. you I'll, I'll give you a scenario. I'll give you a scenario that, for example, in one of those places, in one of those places that we pay. Uh, in the basically in a nursing home, those nursing home that if we if we if we do our anal I mean if we go through the conservative method, we have no business going down there. Really, we have no business. But for certain reason, uh, we feel that it's important to explore the nursing home because it does fall into that scope of analytics, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, we test all the residents there, and what we have found is like. What we have found is that uh, among the elderly, right, among those elderly, uh, and the one that we catch is basically among those elderly, 80% of them are asymptomatic, right? 80% of them are asymptomatic. And uh, some of them, and for example, those that we find in nursing home are not even related to any of the cluster that we have investigated before. So what I'm trying to say is like, if we remain with the current uh, criteria of testing, we might have missed these 10 cases, right? Because these 10 cases, although they were labeled asymptomatic, they were actually pre-symptomatic. Eventually, they will, they will be symptomatic and then eventually they will pass on that infection. So from that point of view, it's like we are able to identify people who might otherwise not be included in the conservative contact tracing. And therefore, we we are able to diagnose them out. We remove the we basically remove the residents from the nursing home, and therefore we manage to uh, mitigate or we manage to avoid a big scale outbreak within that residential home. Save lives. Hopefully. Dr. Zul, yeah, hopefully yes. Doctor Zul, what what do you think some of the yeah. things that you're learning, the lessons that you're learning so far, uh, being in part of the task force, things that you have kind of. Uh, appreciated that you didn't really uh, uh, underappreciate, didn't appreciate the same way before? Right. I must say that uh, um, in some other interviews when I asked quite a direct question like this, you know, reflecting over this experience, moving forward, you need other, you know, viruses to come around and perhaps more virulent, you know, more, more visual. Uh, uh, if, if, if all that we could do is, in fact, just merely uh, 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 locking down or uh, by way of down, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and just, uh, it does not reflect and also well with the kind of, of uh, civilization and the kind of the way of medicine and, and, and technology that we have. So, you know, this is truly my reflection of it. You know, there, there got to be, it, it must be a, a kind of a global response, a regional response. Or, you know, you see, you see OECD countries, you know, European and the, the American, all on their knees, more or less, you know, humbled by this attack of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2. You know, and I'm, I must say that we are not an exception at all. But moving forward, I would, I would really like to see, because there are modalities and how uh, governments, particularly, you know, South Korea, you see Taiwan, you know, and others, you know, managing their kind of challenge in a slightly rather you know very technology based and i would i would you know in all in all in all in all humility i must say that you know we have got to somehow you know cannot take this and cause huge collateral damage in terms of the economic and social psychological impact and much not the least is of course you know on on on, on household and 
domestic kind of of of, of you know collateral damage and you know, problems. So uh, this is what I've come to learn that you know as policymakers, as political leaders, they've got to be serious thinking and the level of preparedness and the level of 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 of, of seeing infectious disease coming this way. Uh, we we could not allow for every time we come on stage on the world stage, you got to be fighting it by just locking down. So this is my reflection, Prof. Uh, Prof. Welsh, that I, I would want Malaysia, particularly slang was a state, you know, to be leveraging on technology, on data, on science, and 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 the next time we come around, we should not be losing RM 2.6 billion a day and having a recession to the extent that we are now going to face a recession and with 2.2 million of job being laid down and you know huge you know on 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 this kind of suffering and agony of 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 the people you know because we we will least we may not be able to be very prepared and we were i must say in, in all in all earnestness in all humility that we were still learning about uh, this disease but we must not, you know, uh, respond it in this way the next time round. It didn't come around. So there must be a better thinking and thinking through and better preparedness and preparation uh, to handle uh, infectious diseases of, of this kind. Mm. Dr. Helmi. Um, I think I just need to add one point, and I think this is actually uh, Dr. Zul's doing back at, that, back at, that, at that time, because I think like uh, the biggest challenge is something that what we don't know that we don't know, right? Like the biggest challenge was to manage the society expectation, to tell them like, hey, we are not aiming for zero cases, but we are aiming, yeah. you know, to live in a tolerable number of cases. And I thought it was very challenging because as a doctor, here I am going to tell people like, hey, chill out. It's going to be okay to live alongside with viruses, right? Like, I mean, those viruses are going to be in the community. You need to find a way to adapt to them. And because uh, there are many infections that we live daily. So for example, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis has been there. It was an ancient disease. It's still rampant in some segment of a society. But for some reason, we are able to, we are able to drive down the fact that it's okay to have a tuberculosis in the society. It's also airborne, but we don't have to shut down the entire society, right? But how do you do that? How do you deliver that message when it comes to COVID-19? Because to put it into our generation, what is so trending now, and the trend is that like, this is little, this is uh, dangerous, is a big thing. And here we are trying to educate the society like, hey, it's okay, you know, like we are not aiming for zero cases. You should be able to live with it. And I think that is one of the biggest challenge that we need to overcome. It, it wasn't it wasn't really me who need to deliver the message. Like, I, I'm just so happy that there are other members of the Selangor uh, Task Force too. Uh, so I think like, yeah, the, the chairman is here to deliver that key message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I must add on to what Dr. Hill is a very, you know, very uh, provocative, uh, pro uh, very provocative kind of statement. Uh, yeah, we, we you know, in all, you know, you know, in all humility, I must also say that you know, uh, we would, would really want to see whether we could really understand, you know, and put in place immunology and and, and epidemiology, so that the, the to to me the challenge, the greatest challenge, this is a, a kind of war. You must have a strategy. The challenge is for 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 the, for the government or even for us in the state government, you know, for the for the entire world, to not observe mortality. You know, we want to we want to reduce that to the minimum. <laughs> that the, the challenge is always to uh, not to allow our facilities to be overwhelmed. For as long as you can get to that and manage this, you know, and, and avoid mortality, uh, you should not like uh, allow uh, the, the whole world to be on their knees. I mean, you know, with global economy, you know, so you know, much less, you know, a country like ours. So. We would, we would we would really want to you know be more you know prepared and and to be leveraging as what Dr. Jeremy said you know uh, um, not just on technology but but on on science on on the science of it on the science of 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 you know even I dare not even use the word here 
herd immunity you know what does it take to acquire herd immunity you know they like the, the modality of sweden for that matter you know uh, so that so that you you really get you, you really get your community to be in a way exposed and and attain attain that kind of immunity for the you know if it ever come be, to come around again that you achieve some some uh, you know level of immunity not even herd immunity as such so those are those are really uh, matters of science you know and, and it's got to be very evidence based and there's a lot more kind of uh, what i call as you know what is known as the zero surveillance kind of thing you got to be you know really on the on on that kind of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, work and, and research in that area that that will really make it you know to to fill the the gaps in the the the, the gaps in knowledge you know so yeah there's a lot more that we still have got to learn about this SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 as a disease. So yeah, I, I would, I must say that you know, uh, we have tried our level best, and there's still room, a lot of room for improvement. Dr. Helmy, any final remarks? Um, no, I'm good for now. I think I'm good for now. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. thank you very much to both of you for sharing these thank insights. Thank you, bro. Right. To really, I think many people don't really know what's going on on the inside, and I think that this has been a very useful conversation. And I think, yes, I agree. We have a lot to learn, and I and the whole part of having this COVID-19 conversation is to contribute to learning. Uh, I really appreciate YB your time uh, uh, and, and and uh, and navigating all the internet challenges that we have, <laughs> Dr. Helmy. Uh, you know, uh, wanting to reach out and be part of the conversation. Uh, it's always lovely to see to hear uh, to see people on the front line, and uh, um, really very gracious of you. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.